There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the, the ability to prophecy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being spoken. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into the one body by the one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Sorry to disappoint anybody, but I'm going to be preaching my own sermon this week, uh, <laughs> and not Jeremy's. So. Guess I'll turn my microphone on anyway. Uh, I'm Matt, associate pastor here. So good to be with you all today. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Joanna and I got a letter in the mail informing us that the church was offering acolyte training to fourth through sixth graders, and this letter was sent to all the families who had kids in that range. We received this invitation because our younger son, David, is in the fourth grade. We had some reservations, though. As many of you know, uh, David has Down syndrome, and not only does he have some intellectual challenges, he's also impulsive. And that's not necessarily the best combination when you're dealing with an open flame. <laughs> But we went out, uh, David and I, to acolyte training, and initially I was not very encouraged. There was some talk of the, the theology of it and the mechanics of it and how the schedule works, and near the very end of the hour we got to practice, and you know, by this time David was losing his mind, and he was just watching videos on my phone. But then it came his turn to practice, and he walked down the center aisle with that uh, torch held high and uh, came right up and, and did a great job. He'd, uh, he'd been watching other people do this and trying to take their wands away from them for <laughs> years. So a couple weeks ago, David did get to Acolyte at the first time, and, and just like at practice, David did a wonderful job. He was very conscientious about it and uh, just did very well. Um, it was very touching and moving to me as David's dad, but I was also moved to, how, to hear how special it was to many people who were at the early service that Sunday who got to see it. We did it at the early service because there's fewer people to set on fire, but. <laughs> but it, it moved me to know how much it moved other people. So that was really a gift. Yeah, you know, the church is a special place. Uh, not least of all because of our insistence that every person from the very young to the very old no matter how smart you are, how much money you have, we believe that every person has gifts to share. And if we can be the kind of community that helps uncover those remarkable gifts, a community that removes impediments to people using their talents for the good, I believe we'll have every last thing that we need to do to do amazing things in Christ's name, even more amazing things than we're doing already. And when we're all working, where we're most gifted, one of the fun things is that it's hardly going to seem like work at all. When you get to the right person in the right place, it's hardly going to seem like work at all because you'll have more fun and you'll get more done than you would have ever imagined. 
We're several weeks now into a series called uh, Life-Changing Relationships, and, and those are the kind of relationships that open us up, uh, open up to us through participation in a community of faith like this one. And the particular dimension of relationship that I want to talk about today are those relationships where you begin to see our differences as strengths and not weaknesses. You'll be invited to celebrate the range of passions and talents and spiritual gifts in this room and to imagine using them together in complementary ways for the common good. But before we go any further, let's pray. Dear God, as we regularly do in this place, we give thanks for all that we have in common, that you are our one Lord, that we have one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, that we have one faith that we share, that we read one Bible. But we also give thanks today for those things that make us different, like a mosaics made of many tiles and a, a hive is made of many bees doing different jobs, a symphony is made of many instruments, and a body is made up of many organs. We pray that we can be brought together in this church in such a way that the sum is greater than the parts. In that kind of special community, help us to find fresh ways to be blessed and to be a blessing to others. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I was asked not long ago to name what it is that I love doing the most in the church. And it might just be Rise Against Hunger. We did this uh, a couple weeks ago here, so some of you are well familiar with what this procedure is. Uh, a big group of volunteers, it's great if you have a hundred or more people, uh, will come into the fellowship hall and they fill these little plastic bags with a, a vitamin packet and a scoop of protein, a, a scoop of vegetables, a scoop of rice. When cooked, this bag is going to feed six people. So the bags are, are weighed and then they're sealed and they're packed into boxes and shipped to a warehouse where they're put into shipping containers that go to places around the world where there's a desperate need. We did pack um, 17,500 meals a couple weeks ago here and, and we're going to pack meals again over at Jefferson Elementary in March. We're going to pack another 10,000 and, and with those we'll have packed over 175,000 meals over the last six years. So it's been a, a tremendous effort. It's, it's been so much fun. And, and I've thought a lot over the years about Rise Against Hunger, though, as if it were a unique way to serve. And in some ways it is. It's, it's unique to be able to have a hands-on way to, to fight global hunger. Those opportunities are pretty rare. But there are a lot of ways in which what we do at Rise Against Hunger is so much like the other things we do at church only crammed into one room on one morning, right? I mean, when we gather as a church, uh, as when we gather at Rise Against Hunger, we take time to give praise and thanks to God. And then in that room, people of different ages and races, newcomers and old-timers, friends from other churches and people from the community can come in and they can work together and grow closer to one another. We serve others, and as is often the case here in this church, we feed them. We're educated about the enormity of the world's problems, but we don't let that discourage us from making a difference where we can, right? Our financial gifts and our labor come together to make great things possible. And there's an important role when we do Rise Against Hunger for people who are wired differently, have different gifts and abilities. There's a place for people who, who love to tote 50-pound bags of rice, and there's a place for the young people who want to run around the whole time. There's a place for people who need to prefer to have a seat while they work and, and, and do the real precise and, and detail work. And while we expend a lot of energy, people generally leave the fellowship hall more energized and enthused than when they came into it, right? All that I've just described seems to me to be a distilled version of what it is to be church. Church is like a rise against hunger event that plays out over weeks and months and years. Church is where we love God and love our neighbors in tangible ways, where strangers become friends, where we find places to serve that are suitable to our gifts and our interests, and we're invited to use our hard work and material resources to bring them together to do great things for others. I think rise against hunger is a lot like church. You know, when the Apostle Paul wanted to find something to compare the church to. He, he didn't think about rise against hunger. They didn't have that in the first century. 
Instead, his metaphor that he chose was a human body. Now, as you might recall, the most fundamental difference that the first generation Jews would have seen between people is between themselves, who practiced and believed the Jewish faith and had this wonderful history that had been handed to them, and between non-Jews, which they referred to as Gentiles. And that's why Paul, in every one of his letters, had to marvel at the thing that had happened in the early church. Because Jews and Gentiles had been reconciled to one another. And how did it happen? Paul said it was only by the blood of Jesus Christ that had brought the two of them together. And the Holy Spirit had, had knit and formed them together into one body. And that kind of unity was nothing short of miraculous. And it was never meant to be taken lightly. But for Paul, unity didn't mean unanimity. It didn't mean that everyone that was in the church had to be the same. It, uh, we got to be part of this body without surrendering what makes us distinctive. And in fact, the more different I am from you, the more glory God gets if we belong to the same church, to the same body. You know that it only is possible by the power of Christ. But the first century church at Corinth had, had lots of problems and, and it tore at their sense of unity. But the thing that got the worst of the Apostle Paul's ire was a, a dispute that they were having over spiritual gifts. Some of the members of the church at Corinth had, had a supernatural gift, right? To be able to speak in other languages. We call this speaking in tongues. And Paul thought it was great if you could speak in tongues. But as a consequence, the people at Corinth who could do this acted as if they were superior to others. And Paul said that was terrible. So he wrote to them. In today's passage, Paul reminds the Corinthians that God had given everyone a gift. Some people can miraculously speak in other languages. Some people can miraculously understand what they're saying. Some have been given the gift of knowledge. Some have been given the gift of wisdom. Faith comes easily to some, and others have a knack for healing. There's no hierarchy to these gifts, Paul says, although it's probably no accident that when he lists them, Paul always puts speaking in tongues last. Because it can lead to some problems. Paul's going to go on to say in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the rest of this chapter, that the whole body isn't an ear, because then how would you see? And the whole body's not an eye, because then how would you hear? And the differences between the members of a body, between the different organs of a body, uh, they're not different, they're not weaknesses at all. They're meant to be used together in complementary ways. And just like that, the church is meant to be stronger together. If we can learn to use these different gifts in ways that complement one another and aren't seen as being in competition. Famously, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's going to say that Remind everybody of what the greatest gift is, right? What's that? Love. 1 Corinthians 13. Three quarters of the weddings that I've preached at, people wanted 1 Corinthians 13, and they don't realize that it was just Paul trying to settle an argument in a church. <laughs> Maybe they'll settle an argument in their marriage, I hope. You know, Paul says that the greatest spiritual gift is not speaking in tongues or anything else that's similarly miraculous. Paul reminds us that the greatest gift is love. Without love, even if you can leap tall buildings in a single bound like Superman, it's not going to amount to much. It won't matter. Without love, nothing else we do counts. So Paul starts his famous chapter by saying that even if I speak in all the tongues of mortals and of angels, if I don't have love, I might as well be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Sometimes it's pastors who need to be reminded of this most of all, that we need to take our ego out of the picture. Right? Sometimes, and there's lots of stories like this, of gifted clergy who let their pride get the best of them, and they can end up mistreating people or thinking that they're entitled to live like kings, or they can commit even worse ethical lapses. But to some degree, I think all clergy struggle to find their proper role in the life of a congregation. And, and sometimes the best thing we can do is just realize that we're not as vital as we think. Um, 
Here's a case in point. I missed a couple days this week. One day I was sick. One day I was out with David while he was sick. And as far as I could tell, no one knew and no one missed me. <laughs> but if Manuel Lopez, who works for our janitorial service, had not been here for two days, you can bet people would have missed Manuel, right? He knows where the paper towels are and he knows how to change them and he has the little key that works the, the holder and Manuel would have been more quickly missed than me. I'm the one with the master's degree in theology, but <laughs> he'll keep you in paper towels and everything else you need. You know, I've, I've been thinking about it this week. I've decided that if the church is the body, I don't think the clergy are meant to be the brains of it. <laughs> And that's not just because there are people out there who are smarter than me. And I think that, I mean, I think it's an asset to have a smart clergy person, but I don't think we're supposed to be the brains of the outfit. And I've grown to think that we're not supposed to be the heart of it either. You know what I think, what part of the body I think we're supposed to be? And don't blurt out the answers if they're inappropriate. <laughs> I've been thinking this week that maybe we're meant to be like a gland. A gland. You know what glands are? The glands are these little small organs situated in the body that put out hormones that regulate the other parts. A gland determines that we need a little more of this and a little less of that. And glands have cascading effects. When they're healthy, they cause our organs and systems to work more effectively together. Our glands rise to prominence when they're needed, but they're just happy to chug along in the background when they're not. And if you have a disorder in one of your glands, it, it causes havoc in your body, as some of you well know. I think my proper role in this church has less to do with doing all the work of ministry that needs to get done than it does with activating others to do the work of ministry, just as the gland activates the different parts of the body. That means I ask a lot of people to do a lot of different things over the course of any given week. I ask some of you to do things so often you may wonder if I ever do anything myself. <laughs> And I do a little, at least, but rarely in isolation. And as much as possible without taking ministry away from somebody who would enjoy it and do great things with it and do as good a job as me or better. The Apostle Paul says that our work takes on special meaning when we invite the Holy Spirit to guide us. It's the Holy Spirit that's at work in giving us gifts, gifts that are meant for the common good, and they weren't just given to your clergy, right? Would you read with me what Paul says at the start of today's lesson? Let's see if that scripture comes up there. Let's read that together. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So the question of the day is, what spiritual gift or gifts has God given you? Not for your own benefit, but for the common good. We talked before about how certain factions in Corinth thought their ability to speak in other languages in worship was a uniquely wonderful gift that made them superior to others. But I find more often in the church it's the case that people devalue their gifts and downplay them. Right? And it's all out of a misguided sense of humility. I, I run into that fairly often. And I don't mean to pick on anybody because there's lots of reasons why somebody could decline to do something I ask. But, but sometimes I wonder when I hear things, you know, when people tell me, oh no, I couldn't teach a class, I couldn't serve communion, I couldn't lead the prayer, I couldn't visit the hospital. You're looking for somebody else. You're looking for somebody who's more holy, somebody who's a better speaker, somebody who's more caring, somebody who knows their Bible better. And sometimes I just wonder what people are so afraid of. There's a, a quote that's stuck with me over the years uh, from somebody who's a spiritual author. She was a short-time presidential candidate, but I'm not endorsing her for anything. But I do like this quote, and I'm going to share it, from Mary Ann Williamson. She said, Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and famous? Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. 
Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. Because when we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give people permission to do the same. I like that. I wouldn't have voted for her, but I sure do like what Marianne Williamson had to say there. I, I think it underlines a point that the Apostle Paul was making, right? If God's the giver of every gift we have and those gifts are meant for the common good, then we can be saved from excessive modesty or excessive pride. Our gifts are not about us at all. When it comes to these gifts, it's about God who gives it and the people who need to receive it. And all that we are in the transaction is the conduit. It just passes through us. So there's no reason for us to be prideful or modest about it. If we were to hide the light that God gives us under a bushel basket, that wouldn't be humility. That would be wastefulness, right? Some of you remember uh, Gary Shaw, who was a member of this church uh, for years before he moved to state. So uh, Gary was great at making videos that we would use in church, and, and we had uh, tasked him one year to make a video uh, to use celebrating our Christmas mission offering. And he, he really did a fabulous job with it. And it was the Sunday that we were supposed to use this version of it, though, and I forgot. I forgot to put it in the slides. I forgot to have it included. And, and after he had done all this work, and so afterwards I, I went up to, to Gary, and I was so apologetic. I felt so bad about not using this video that he'd worked so hard on. And I'll never forget what he said. It's like, nah, no big deal. It all goes on God's refrigerator. <laughs> I'd never heard that before. Have you guys heard that before? I think that's an awesome thought, that it all goes on God's refrigerator. What, what a beautiful way of seeing things. Gary was saying that when we do our best for God, no matter what anyone else thinks or doesn't think, our efforts go on God's refrigerator. Like a parent of a preschooler who's doing some fledgling efforts at art, like the, the parent of the elementary school kid who works so hard in math uh, to bring their grade up to a B minus and puts that B minus proudly on their fridge. You know, God is proud when we do work that's done to please God and, and not to please anyone else or to get their recognition. And when we start to see things like that, it's really unburdening. It's really liberating to see it that way. You know, a lot of people um, a couple weeks ago when David took his turn acolyting said they were tempted to clap, but I'm kind of glad they didn't. You know, because David, like all the rest of us, needs to learn that we do things um, out of a sense of duty. We do them for God. We do them out of uh, our obligations and, and not just to get praise. You know, most of the work that gets done in a church goes insufficiently recognized. There are few people other than your pastors who are adequately thanked for what we do. From the people who chop vegetables to the people who change light bulbs to the people who teach children, this, work would, this church would fall apart without the work that's done on a weekly basis. And some people prefer to work behind the scenes and, and some are willing to be up front. Some are happiest when they're just told what to do. And other people just stun me with the way that they can organize and lead others. I can't thank the people of this church enough. And since I don't even come close, take comfort in knowing that your good work ends up on God's fridge. One of the gifts that I think that God has given me, and I try not to take excessive pride about it, but I, I do like this about myself. But one of the gifts I think God has given me is, is helping to connect people with avenues of service that are meaningful to them. I, I love to be able to say to people, I've seen this gift in you, and therefore I was wondering if you'd like to try this opportunity for service. Right? I love to do that. And, and I think I do a good job of it. And I, it's as rewarding as anything I do. But here's something you might not know. Our church has 1,200 members and probably at least another 300 constituents who worship here part of the time, and it is a woefully small percentage of those folks that I know well, and, uh, and some that I just know by name or by sight. So I may very well tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, would you consider doing this? 
I've seen this gift in you and think you would do great at that. But the safe bet is that you know yourself a lot better than I know you. So my hope and prayer is that you'll be on the lookout, right? That you'll be searching for ways to use the gifts that God has given you, right? I, I hope you'll read your bulletin in the newsletter and, and listen for the spoken announcements. And, and you know, if we put something out there and, and nobody signs up and nobody agrees to do it, maybe that's just God's way of telling us that a ministry has seen its season, right? Maybe the Spirit is, is leading us in different directions. Maybe the Spirit's leading you. Maybe you'll observe this need uh, in the church or in the world that you'll be able to be the one to respond to and address. And maybe nobody uh, in the leadership, the official named and titled leadership of the church had ever recognized it before. The Holy Spirit speaks to all of us, gives gifts to all of us, invites all of us to use them. So you'll probably come up with your own great ideas in conversation with the Spirit. That's really the number one thing I could re recommend to you is that you just spend some time in, in thought and prayer and reflecting on passages like this one that say that we've all got a gift to share and it's meant for the common good. I, I think there's amazing ways to be in ministry already, but there are amazing opportunities that are out there for, for faithful and fruitful things that we can do in Christ's name. So, so be on the lookout for ways to help you uncover your gifts, to get increasing clarity about what they are, and, and, and to figure out ways to use them to further kingdom, God's kingdom right here on earth. In the hope of that, let's pray. We thank you, God, how it is that you've given us each individual gifts and talents and passions and have charged us to find ways to use them for the common good. Save us from undue pride in our gifts, but make us willing to be bold in exercising them so that others might be blessed and so that you would get the glory. Amen.